I'm Nicole Lezen. I'm one of the local consultants along with Nicole Young, who facilitates a countywide initiative called the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based or CORE Investments, which is a collective impact approach to achieving equitable health and well-being for all people across the lifespan in Santa Cruz County. We're co-facilitating today's conversation about harnessing local data to create the core conditions for safe, just communities with Eva Holt from DataShare Santa Cruz County and Eric Morris from the Santa Cruz County Health Services Agency. And as people are doing that, I will turn it over to Eva Holt, who will give us a quick overview of DataShare before we dive into some more data details. Go ahead, Eva. Hi, good morning. My name is Eva and I'm a social impact consultant based here in Santa Cruz County. And um, I help facilitate this platform, Data Share Santa Cruz County. So <clears throat> uh, thanks for um, kicking us off, Nicole. Um, DataShare is an interactive data platform with over 400 indicators from local, state, and national sources. Um, and we aim to have updated versions of all data and reports with the most current information. And the platform is constantly changing, adjusting, new indicators uh, being added. And our goal is to be the central hub of information that creates alignment by allowing everyone to measure outcomes with similar metrics and data indicators. The platform also provides easy visualization and integration of data sets, which are aligned with coalitions and collective impact efforts um, such as um, CORE or the Safety Net Coalition. And some of these coalitions um, have added their data to the site so that it can be used by the community at large and is easily available for the public use um, for students, for researchers, advocacy, program evaluations, grant writing, fundraising, etc. And I just want to share that in addition to being a platform, we are a collaboratively uh, run project. So we try and make decisions um, with equity at the center. And one of the ways that we do that is by following our equity framework. Um, these are some of the equity principles. We have these so we can make decisions and prioritize the use of our data and our capacity, our literacy efforts, our communications in order to best be aligned with our values and principles. So for example, um, this framework is applied to how we add locally generated data to the platform um, and how we make those decisions. And I'm really happy to be here, thank you. Thanks, Eva. Let me stop sharing my screen for just a moment while I switch to sharing with you how to get to the results menu in DataShare. So I'm hoping everyone can see this. This is the landing page for DataShare Santa Cruz County and Gisela is putting the link into the chat. So I'll just show you how I get to the core results menu. There are many ways, but I think the easiest way is to click on this local progress tab and it's the first thing there. So the core results menu, as many of you may know, was developed as part of core investments. It's housed on data share so that the local data, the 400 indicators that Eva mentioned are accessible and can be linked to the results menu, which is a shorter vetted list of um, some of the indicators related to each of these eight core conditions uh, for health and well-being. It's really a tool that can help you identify community strengths and needs, set goals for community well-being, no matter what, what area you're working in, track your progress and connect strategies and program outcomes to promising practices, both local ones and state and national ones, 
and then um, provide some community impacts in each of the core conditions. So it's if you're not familiar with how this works, it might be uh, worth some time just trying to dig through some of these tools that you see here. And the menu itself is organized into these tiles that you see here. All of these materials, the community impacts, the tools, the indicators related to each of the core conditions are the product of many, 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 many conversations um, and really are co-designed with partners across multiple sectors, people who attended some large convenings that we call core conversations over the last few years. We had a, a core steering committee that guided this work um, and, and other community partners like the Human Care Alliance, the Children's Network, the Elderly and Disabled Transportation Advisory Committee, and many, many others. So a few things just to note about the results menu and data share overall. We're gonna be focusing here on the safe and just communities ones that you see in the lower left, but there are hundreds more indicators than shown here on data share overall. We just, as I mentioned, tried to curate some key ones with, with a lot of community and partner input that would really have a, a portrait for each core condition and the desired impacts. Some of these other tools also align with these. And we just um, want to say that although, as Eva mentioned, uh, data share has come a long way in the last few years since it was launched in 2019, and it will continue to improve and be filled out, you'll still see some blanks and placeholders. You'll see that some of the data elements, including the ones we're going to look at today, are in wish list status. That means that somebody thought they would be really important to track, and we agree, but they're not available yet in a form that would make them suitable for inclusion in data share. But the landscape of data and publicly available data sets um, changes so fast that we really encourage everyone to check back frequently and see what's new and different on data share. It changes almost daily in terms of these improvements and Eva and Eric are, are shepherding those improvements on behalf of our county. So today we're gonna to explore how to use all of these data with complete with their flaws and gaps as a springboard for discussion about what we can all do as a community to contribute to equitable health and well-being for everyone in our county. And as I mentioned, our focus today is gonna to be just on these three indicators under safe and just communities. We've been doing these deeper dives. Some of you may have attended um, on, on each of the other core conditions. So we're almost through the end of this series and we'll have one coming up. We'll provide some more details on stable, affordable housing and shelter. But for today, we're gonna to look at these three impacts Individuals and families are free from all forms of violence, neighborhoods and communities are safe, and justice systems are fair, restorative, and promote healing. Under each of these are individual indicators related to those. Um, we'll see what we can find out about each of them in smaller group discussions. Or Actually, let me check with Nicole. Are we... I think we're going to stay as one stay group, as one group. Okay. and we'll have Eva start off with the That's first great. impact and then we'll move through the others uh, as there's time. That sounds great. Okay, so the format will be that we will, um, let me stop sharing for just a moment. We're going to explore some questions together as a large group then instead of small groups, and we'll just see how far we get, and we hope everyone will find this um, instructive as well as interesting enough to come back and pursue some of this on your own when you have more time. But we're gonna talk about each of these areas in terms of the stories that they tell us, um, starting with the assets that are already in place, and then really think about what might be missing or what gaps you notice in the data. Um, there are always gaps, but we think that it's useful to just um, explore why they're there and how we might be able to address them as opposed to just lamenting the fact that there are gaps. And as I mentioned, they, they don't always persist. So sometimes we have an opportunity to fill those gaps. So that's another reason to talk about them together. And then we also want to explore, um, many of you are coming to this, this session and this topic with your own rich experience in this, in this work. 
So what are the, from your point of view, what are the programs and practices and policies that either are already in place or are needed to create better conditions for um, optimal, safe, and just communities for everyone across the lifespan? This is left over from our, our previous session. Apologies for that. Um, but it's the same idea. What, what are the what are the policies and programs related to this particular core condition that are either here already or could be? And then how do we build on the data that we do have to measure change, to learn more about what works and what doesn't work, and how to track and assess our collective impact across these different areas? So that's what we're going to do together, starting with Eva and the first uh, topic and set of indicators. And I'm happy to share my screen, Eva, unless you want to. to... Oh, sure. That sounds great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So just let me know. Great. Where you um, go. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm wondering if um, maybe if uh, the participants in the chat can just put um, on a scale of one to five, five being super familiar and one being, this is my first time on the platform. If you can just put in what your experience is on the platform so that as we're going through the indicators, I can be aware of, um, you know, just your familiarity. That would be really helpful. Thank you. Great. So um, this is the Safe and Just Communities Impact Area one, individuals and families are free from all forms of violence. So this list of indicators um, that Nicole is scrolling down, I think there's six of them on this particular impact page. And on each impact area, there's um, a variety. Sometimes there's more, sometimes there's less. And you'll see that these first three have a data point that are aligned with the indicator specifically, and they show an overview of what the data is saying. So you can see an arrow pointing up, pointing down, um, and these are overall trends. And we'll get into it in a second. If you keep scrolling down, you'll see that we have some wish list items of things that we wish we could have a measure for, but we currently don't have a viable data source for and are looking or are trying to integrate um, any local reports or qualitative data that might help us better understand this particular measure in our county. Great. And at the bottom of this page, you'll see related content. So these are qualitative content areas. Um, usually they're reports, sometimes they're strategic plans, sometimes um, they are links to other data sources that are related. Um, and just so that you know that they're here, you can always come back to them. And Nicole, would you go up to the beginning of the page? Um, and let's explore substantiated child abuse rate. So you can go into see more data or you can click onto any of the arrows that are um, pointed there. And this will take you to the indicator detail page. So each data point has a detail page. They're all formatted the same and it'll give you the measurement period at the top. Um, if if it's available um, to be broken out by region or zip code, you'll see that there's the little circle at the top as well, just under the title. Um, or at the bottom of the page here, there will be an option. For this particular indicator, that's not the case, but we can disaggregate this data by uh, different subgroups, including age and race and ethnicity. Thank you, Nicole. So you can see that there is a difference between um, the substantiated child abuse rate by age that's reported and also by race and ethnicity. Um, for those of you that are less familiar with the visualization of the data, um, you'll see that here the in the bar charts, the overall value is darker. And then there's this gray value for the other areas. Um, the way that the color coding in these bar charts work, and we might see this in uh, if we get a chance to explore the other data points, is that if there's um, a colored value, then that means that there's a uh, significant uh, 
significant statistical difference being represented in the trend of that particular subgroup. Um, and what that just means is that what we see here, because it's gray, it's not colored red or green, which would um, align with um, either a, a, a positive or a, a negative, I don't know if those are the correct words, but um, the statistical difference that is significant, significantly larger or smaller than the overall value, um, then it would be color coded that way. So all that to say that while when you're looking at these charts, it can look like a significant difference. Um, statistically speaking, for this particular indicator, there isn't a statistical difference that is significant between the ages or the race and ethnicity of substantiated child abuse, according to this data source, which if you scroll up, I just want to show the group where the data source is. Um, thank you. Yeah. So this will take you to where this data comes from and describe exactly, you know, what the measures of um, data collection are, et cetera, if that is important to your work. So we can see here the trend over time or the change over time has um, changed. <laughs> Thank you, Nicole, for scrolling over those, um, those charts that can be really helpful. And the last period of measures, 2021, generally these data points are updated on an annual basis, but sometimes that data isn't collected every year. Um, and uh, with the COVID, 19 pandemic, there has been um, some delays in data collection. Thank you. You'll see that the last update um, here was August of last year. So they updated it, um, the platform vendor updated it, but there wasn't data to be added. So I'm still waiting. Probably this August, it will be uploaded. Um, great. Maybe I think I just want to say, um, if we look at the overall comparison at the top, you'll see these all of these comparison trends are in green, which means that the value is a positive public health measure. So it just means that the measurement is showing that there's a positive trend. If these were red or gray, um, it would have a different meaning. So compared to the California value, it's lower and a positive trend. US value the same. It, compared to the prior value, it's lower and also a positive trend. And you can see the trending arrow. And it, um, as Nicole is scrolling over, it's helpful to look at the technical notes if you're just learning um, how these indicator visualizations are posted. So that was how to read an indicator page. I feel like it's helpful, um, even for me, that has um, more familiarity on the platform. Um, so I'd like to open it up to discussion. We had those four questions in the beginning when we first, right before we passed over, thank you. Um, and that seems like a great group. So um, I, we can just take initial impressions of what the data was sharing there um, for that indicator, substantiated child abuse. Um, the first question is what stories do the indicators tell about the assets and people or places in our communities? I don't know if it would be helpful to look at the data point. Um, I'm seeing a nod. Um, do you want to share the data point, Nicole? <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> so what this says here is that there's two cases of substantiated child abuse for 1,000 children, according to the Child Welfare Dynamic Report System. So. For those who work in this space, um, it'd be interesting to hear your insights on this particular measure. If it's aligning with 
what you think or if any of the subgroups give you um, more storylines to fill out the complexity of this particular data point. Or you can talk about whatever you want. Or you can ask questions. I just want to say um, that, I mean, when I look at the line graph and just, you know, it's, it's really clear that the downward trend is, you know, a positive thing. That's what we would hope for. Um, this chart uh, shows starting point as 2014, but like if you were to go back even further, you would actually see that in our county, there were years, there was a period of time, quite a, a number of years where our countywide rate of substantiated reports was much higher than the state's rate. And so there was a clear point in time when it when it uh, started declining and then stayed below. And even though, you know, we're careful not to say like a, a particular program caused that or what, you know, that, that it actually really coincides with a couple countywide programs that were implemented, um, like the Families Together Differential Response Program, like the Triple P Positive Parenting Program. Um, and this also you know, reflects changes like in policy and practices in child welfare, but there's um, a lot kind of, uh, kind of beneath the surface in terms of understanding and explaining the story that we see in the data. Yeah, I'll just say I'm, I'm pleased to see we are significantly lower than California overall. That's nice to see. And that downward trend is always hopeful. Um, could you scroll down to the, I'm interested about the race and ethnicity. Um, and I'm wondering how that compares to sort of the census data. I mean, the because there's no colors, like you said, it's not as significant, um, but, you know, higher than overall value. Yeah, so just interested in the equity around sort of racially, what, what are we seeing in terms of more child abuse or less according to which populations. That that data point is always interesting to me because as a as a county, we don't have a tremendous amount of diversity, but we're getting there. <laughs> um, so that that piece is always interesting for me. Thanks, Julian. I'll I'll just point out when you scroll over these, when you scroll over anything in data share, you get more more information. But so this is just calling out the fact that this scale at the bottom. It's from zero to two, basically, and that the differences are small. Is the absolute number shown anywhere? That's a good question. Um, so these are cases per thousand children. I'm wondering yeah, if the two, expert chart, if it... No, so I think that for, so the, for the data points that are listed as rates, um we just have the rate because that's you know for the population data mm -hmm. um does the original source we could go take a look okay <laughs> and then this is how the rabbit hole begins <laughs> okay i'm just curious because the data is somewhat encouraging that about the situation, but then when you take it down to back to real lives, I'm wondering, well, how many children are we talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, so there's 268,000 uh, residents in Santa Cruz County. So there's 268 uh, substantiated child abuse cases is I guess how you would get to that. You say so, that again? So um, for me, when I'm trying to look at what the absolute point is or mm -hmm. the absolute um number is i just um look at our population uh overall demographic so because we have 268,000 residents in the county and the rate is 2 for 1000 but that was child abuse not total abuse not a 
Oh, um, um, you're right. So then we just would need to look at um, like how many children are in Santa Cruz right, right, right. under 18. That's how I would do it personally. I probably, be, you know, but this is, this is a very deep dive chart here. Look, and the data is, um, <clears throat> is updated for the 2022 markers. Yeah, I'm just curious. So for the statewide, I don't know my way around this data set enough, but I'm guessing that we can get some county numbers like, like these. Yeah, you would probably just filter by report options. Mm -hmm. Those are still mm -hmm. rates, but they are still rates. Let's see what it says. Oh, total child. There's the, one. Yeah. Total look, children look. with substantiations gives you the. Oh, okay. So that's the number then of cases, right? This does seem to be the number. Okay. Thanks. That, that is really interesting. And then let's say you were trying to use this. It looks like you could do some other dates. As Nicole mentioned, maybe you would see a longer trend line if you did a longer time period. Looks like you could do age groups, ethnicity, sex at birth. But also in data share, if you were using this for a report or a proposal or something, you could export the data and, and play with it further. So. Just to stay down in the rabbit hole, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we like our rabbit holes. Right. Alternatively, too, if you go back to the indicator detail page, I think I just want to make a note that I don't, I'm not sure if I did. Um, each indicator detail page, in addition to the data source at the bottom of the tables, will have related content. So I, I like this one because it gives you this list of indicators that are related. And the first one is an, is just the name is more asset based mm -hmm. than you know, right? So we have the one that is substantiated child abuse. And then this one is um, children ages zero to three who do not experience recurring neglect or abuse. So it can maybe give you a different picture. I haven't delved into that particular indicator, um, but it gives you some other related ones. And then it'll give you some other resources. So if this is your field and you need to look at some related data that may or may not be available on the site, you can see the other data resources, um, related reports that have been added to the page through our community partnerships. Um, and um, this other list of um, related content. You're talking about what stories do these indicators show? And if you could scroll up a little bit, the one that stands out to me is, keep going, is this one right here, is the under the substantiated um, by age. That's a huge difference in my opinion. And that tells me that there's, we don't know the whole story there. Um, for those of us who work in this field, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't really look accurate. So it's, I'm wondering about, you know, systems of how abuse is um, tracked and that sort of thing. So for me, that's telling me a story that we don't have all the information on that one. I kind of wondered if it's because uh, younger children are more um, watched in a sense. They have more medical uh, appointments for vaccinations and are tend to be maybe more in more childcare programs or something. I was wondering if it wasn't if it was again more the chance to observe and to and to count. I don't know how you would check that out. Yeah, but the school age kids, I, so you know, you're in school all day. I don't know. It's, it's not right, but over the last like since 2019, maybe they weren't in school all day, right? Right. Yeah. So anyway, 
it tells a story that I think we don't have the whole story. <laughs> And oftentimes, the, and I don't think this one is included on data share, but oftentimes there's a big difference too between the number of reports that have been made to child welfare and then how many are actually substantiated, which is what we're looking at here, which means that there was some kind of process to look into the situation, to meet with the family, to get a better understanding of um, you know, the, the home environment, the family environment, the safety, and then at the end of that, then it was determined that there, were, that there was a high enough level of concern or risk to say, yes, the report um, is consistent with what um, the, the investigation or the process found. So that's what this number is saying. So there often is, and so I'm wondering, Lynn, if maybe that's part of what you're thinking of too, that there might be a high number of reports, but the actual number that are um, considered substantiated can be less. Um, well, I don't know. I, I mean, it says substantiated. So I'm just curious about how, how people are tracked. I don't know. I'm not sure what it says. It's, um, it's interesting to me. Anyone else have thoughts or experience or insights about, and, and this, I would say this kind of conversation, the kinds of questions that it's bringing up, that's the, that's, that really is the uh, main point of all this, right? That oftentimes we see a data point and at first glance, it might seem like it tells us one thing, but really it should cause us every time to ask these kinds of questions. What is that really saying? What's beneath the surface there? What other things do I need to find out or ask about so that, especially if I'm using a data point in a grant, application or a report or a needs assessment um, that we're, you know, that I'm using it responsibly, that I'm conveying the meaning of it or the limitations of it uh, as accurately as possible. So even just having this kind of conversation is I think, exactly what uh, we would hope is happening. It seems like this could be a good tool and I don't mean to make light of it or anything, but like for icebreakers or for conversation starters, right? I see Heather has a hand raised. I'm on my phone, so I can't really see too deeply onto the page, but can you disaggregate from like whether or not uh, it's the report is from one individual multiple times, or is it just a collective group of just all the reports? Does that make any sense what I said? Maybe I could try it. Yes, no, it makes sense. Okay. You can't, you can't disaggregate by, there's no um, identifier for um, the abuser. Okay. Yeah. And I think that for that kind of deeper dive, it might make sense to go to the source page again, um, okay. the child welfare source page. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure what kind of tracking there is on abuser data. Eva, did you want to have the group discuss other questions about this one, or do you want to move on to maybe look at one of the other indicators that Eric or Nicole were going to review? Yeah, I think we can we can uh, move to another indicator. Yeah. Um, Eric, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. It works for me. If you don't mind, Nicole, going to impact two. So here we are on impact two, which is neighborhoods and communities are safe. If you don't mind scrolling on down, Nicole, to violent, uh, violent crime, violent crime rate, it should be all the way at the bottom. And if you can see more data for me. 
that'd be great. So as Eva so finally put it, is that if you're looking at this indicator, you can see the compared to for the California counties, the California value, which is in green, the US value, which is in red, the prior value, which is a little nice triangle pointed upwards, and the trend point is green pointing down. As Eva has put it, the red means that we are going up in rates compared to other to the US value and to the prior value, but overall the trend is pointing down. And as you scroll on down to the line graph, you can actually visualize this by just how it is a downward trend with one spike in 2019 in this regard. Uh, compared to one of the indicators, I kind of want to ask this question, but what is like one thing that you can see missing from this indicator that you would like to have? Or like, what do you see is missing? Well, I'll start it off. Uh, so the one thing I see that's missing is that there's like no breakdown of like race, ethnicity, nothing that, that tells you how old or who or what is causing these types of violent crimes in Santa Cruz County and why or and that type of breakdown. And as Eva has pointed out, this one, this last indicator was updated in January, 2023 and just, it doesn't tell a lot of stories about this indicator on like what is changing, how are we doing it? We can see that we're having sort of an impact, but not really because of the spike in 2019 and sort of the upwards trend in 2021. And yeah. And then if any other questions or This is biased, of course, by the work that Walnut Avenue does, and maybe even Lynn knows the answer to this, but for me, it's interesting that that's a separate statistic than domestic violence. So I guess unless, you know, unless it's, it, unless a domestic violence incident happens to be charged in one of those four categories, like I forget what the assault one was, aggravated assault, then domestic violence would not show up in here. So I just, I find that interesting. It's nothing new. We know that domestic violence crimes are, are not, they don't necessarily show up in the stats. <laughs> um, but that was just the note that I made in looking at this, that it misses, it, it misses that big section of violent crime. It doesn't show that piece. Mm -hmm. It's a good observation. So maybe we can move on to another indicator, if you don't mind, Nicole, if you don't mind going back one. And then we can go to homicides. I think that's scroll on up a little bit for me. Right there. And click see more data. And just as we did with the last one, compared to the, uh, scroll on down a little bit, if you look at doesn't tell a whole lot of stories about it. It does show that we're still trending upward and that we haven't like gone down in recent years compared to 2020 to 2021, but this measurement period hasn't been updated or at least it, actually it has been updated in January, 2023, but does not show 2022. So, I mean, it's missing a ton of data in relates to race, ethnicities, and just what the age difference of who is causing these homicides is what I'm seeing. And so, yeah, it's just another one that I feel like could be fleshed out a little bit in terms of those breakdowns. And again, uh, Julie and Lynn, you may have these data at hand, but I know there's been concern about um, escalating domestic violence and femicide women being killed by partners over the same time period. So it would be really helpful to know that in this statistic. 
Yeah, something that's an ongoing conversation is that, you know, some of the organizations we have data and that we are, you know, reporting to state funding sources, federal funding sources, and yet getting that data into our local <laughs> data share, um, for whatever reason, there seems to be a barrier there that I've, we've been talking about in various meetings, various venues, but we still haven't gotten over that hurdle. Julie, can you say again, where is that data being submitted to? And is it something that like across the state, like are multiple counties reporting that same data or is it something that's unique to Santa Cruz County? Well, I mean, as an example, if we think about the grants that we are funded by that are from major, um, you know, federal organizations such as HUD, Cal OES, um, Cal OES is through the Department of Justice. So they are collecting quarterly data from us. And though when I have turned around and tried to pull some of their data out, um, it's been a little bit more challenging. And I haven't explored data share in a while. So maybe it's been updated since last I've been in there. But in theory, it, you know, it, it would be nice if we would have a direct connection into those DOG, um, I'm sorry, um, DOJ, Department of Justice um, statistics that I know Monarch and Walnut Avenue are consistently <laughs> compiling and um, providing to them. Um, and so, but it's just, it comes down to then who, you know, who's responsible then for making sure that data get in, gets into data share. You, you know, of course we're turning in our quarterly reports, but that's another, another step to then turn around and make sure that that's also being posted on data share as well, which, depending on how you look at it, is not that big of a deal or it is because it's time consuming. Yeah, yeah, it is time consuming. Um, for anything that is like mandated um, at the state level and um, has, a, has a large enough, pop, there's like a few things that we would need to look at to see if we can add it to the site or request our vendor to add it to the site. But um, if you're re reporting to the DOJ and it's mandated, um, if you give me a list of the indicators, just the list of indicator names and where you're reporting it, you can just send me the link. Um, I can speak with our platform vendor to see if there is a possibility for having those updated. Um, there is a lag, especially with DOJ, just so that you know. So I think we have like 10 indicators on the site that are from the DOJ um, database, and they, they it's really um, cumbersome process to get that data from them, even our vendor that has a contract with them. And like, they're still just we're, we just, there is a lag, but um, at least it would be um, at your fingertips, even if it's, you know, slightly older than what you reported last quarter, maybe it would be a, an annual reporting um, rather than, or, you know, an annual data point rather than a quarterly data point that would be added to the site. Um, but if you, if you can get that list to me, um, there is actually on the site a way that you can do this, but you can just send me an email and um, that works great too. Great, thank you. Yeah, I have no doubt with these beasts, these big federal <laughs> systems are very difficult to navigate on, on all sides. So I appreciate that, thank you. And I do apologize, I'm gonna have to leave at 11, but thank you for this discussion. Thank you. And um, we just got a question in the chat about linking to cradle to career state data when it comes online. So um, I'm not sure exactly um, where that data will be housed. But again, if it's a man, a state mandate, and there's comparative values. Um, so if you know, you can see generally that's four um, points in time that need to be compared at a minimum in order for the data to be statistically viable to load onto the site. So, you know, from four years or, um, you know, four measurement periods over the last 10 years, um, and that the data will be continuously con 
collected so that we know that this exact data point will be collected next year, et cetera. Um, we can always make that request. Um, and um, Cradle to Career actually has a local progress page, which we're currently revamping on the site. So in the beginning of this call, I mentioned that um, for um, collaboratives, coalitions, collective impact measures. Um, we have a tool on the site called Local Progress Pages, um, and you can add your coalition's data on that page. Um, so for example, SafeRx collects and measures um, data uh, as a coalition that they track um, their outcomes from. Uh, so we can always talk about that option as well. So currently Cradle to Career has a page on here. Um, I think it's the fourth one down, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and um, they, there's a lot of changes with Cradle to Career um, right now, which is great, some expansion. Um, but you can see that they've chosen data points um, that measure each of their four outcomes for success um, that are that are already on the site. So those are those population public health measures of the you know 400. Um, and um, and then they also have on here some um, program uh, level data from their annual report and that is just available to those people who want to get onto this site and make a comparison between the measurable outcomes at the public um, health level at the macro level and um, the program um, the local program and its measures and now that um, cradle to career is countywide um, that comparison will be a more viable uh, viably statistically sound measure to um, compare. So I don't know when the rollout is going to be for the state, um, Heather, and um, yeah, I'm I'm in the dark, but I am talking to them about making changes to their local progress page. So sounds like there's movement. I did Heather, it, it might be a good thing to um, make sure that HCI, the platform vendor, is also keeping track of or aware of the state cradle to career system, because um, I was just looking at their website, the state's website, there's a number of different data dashboards that they are planning on, I think, developing. And so it, it'd probably be good to think about, are there things from the state dashboards that could somehow be incorporated or linked to, to data share? That's Thank different, you. That's different from the our what our local cradle to career initiative is. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we want to move on to the third impact area, Nicole. Can I just commit, oh, yeah. um, one quick comment? It would be really helpful for those of us who are doing this, especially with all this gun control um, going on. If, if it was broken down, if we had the statistics on, on whether it was gun violence, whether it was, we have more stabbings generally than gun violence, but it doesn't show in this data. And we could use that. I'm just saying that that would be something that could be added to this chart that would be helpful. Thank you. Let me do this, a similar tour of this third um, community impact that justice systems are fair, restorative, and promote healing. And so under this grouping, we have some um, things like adult arrest rates. We, we don't have a lot of data in some other categories, but some um, deaths in custody, expulsion rates, um, juvenile arrest rates, suspension rates, Community-based crime prevention is one of those wish list items that, that were suggested. Same with um, crisis intervention and de-escalation techniques and um, differences and disproportionate differences in um, incarceration and prosecution of people in communities of color. Again, related content might for some of these missing areas be a place to go. Um, so these are some places where 
Um, some links are available already. And then this is just one of those areas that was a new compilation of um, some varied indicators. So we're gonna look at the arrest rate one, just to reinforce what you've seen with some others. There are comparisons to in different dimensions. So to other California counties, where we're kind of in a medium zone um, compared to the California state value, we're, we're higher and therefore worse. But compared to prior values over time, we are doing better than our prior value. And um, similarly over, over a larger trend line over time. So these are just, again, these snapshots that give you some points of reference um, that sometimes are mixed signals depending on what the, what the basis for comparison is, but they're useful. And then if we go into, try to go into more detail, this is one of those indicators that does offer some um, additional um, by data by gender and by race ethnicity. So the measurement period is still 2021. Um, it was updated in January 2023, meaning that the 2022 data are not yet available, but could be soon. So this is another one that would warrant some um, rechecking soon-ish. And the um, all, all of the indicators we've been talking about, all of the indicators on this site are, are going to have some, um, some COVID changes in, in these time periods. So that's another thing to keep in mind. But if we click on race ethnicity, it just adds those data points. So again, as Eva mentioned, we don't see, despite the, the real difference here in the Black African American juvenile arrest um, rates, it, it is not showing up in a, a color. And I'm not sure why. It may be because the population is small. And so those numbers, while it's a large percentage difference, may not be an absolute number. I don't know if you know what the thresholds are for when things show up as red or green, but um, but again, you know, scrolling over any of these items gives you the actual data points and some additional information. And where possible, it, it is really helpful to have these, um, these other dimensions available, because as you can see, those overall numbers do really mask um, some significant disparities. So let me um, also do a quick scroll through here. Again, if you keep going down on each indicator page, you can get additional indicators to look at additional resources to look at. And, and this is, this is um, a cost of time, but it, sometimes it does really yield some things that are helpful for, in particular for grant writing, which is um, a topic of an upcoming core coffee chat. Sometimes these promising practices ones can give you some ideas either about programmatic elements or ways to measure and evaluate progress. There might be funding opportunities that you weren't necessarily aware of that you might want to explore. There are some local stories, as Eva mentioned, that we have here. Um, there are some other pages from local plans in particular, in this case, the county strategic plan that might have some other ways of looking at these data and other reports that might be relevant. So it would be easy to spend some time on any one of these categories, but if any of them call out to you, this is the place to look. So I'll go back up here to our overview and just ask what stories this might indicate to you about our county on juvenile arrest rates. Does anybody have particular insights or questions about what you're seeing here? Well, one thing I see, Eva, is that at least the trend is going down in regards to that, but most of them seem to be, uh, most of these 
I don't know what the, I forget what the indicator is. Can you scroll up real fast? Juvenile arrest rates. It seems like most of the juvenile arrest rates have been mostly males. Yes. On that. And then uh, African Americans. That's at least what the story it tells from this type of data. Thank you, Eric. Mm -hmm. That definitely does not represent the demographics of our county, which is pretty disturbing to see that. It is. Is this new information for those of you involved in this work? Unfortunately not, but it's just a real reminder that we need to do better. Exactly. And, and what might that involve? What might doing better mean in terms of programs or policies? I wish I had the answer, but I do think that this should be looked into. Um, that's a real disparaging thing. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, if it's not matching the demographics, what if these are people that are coming from other areas? Like, how do you disaggregate that? Like, are you being arrested in this area, but are you not from this area? Like, how, is there a way to disaggregate that data? I don't or know. The repeat, repeat. Like, it, is it the same person getting arrested multiple times? Like, I can't, I can't see those things in the data, you know? And then we also might want to back up and think about what are the factors that, that lead to an arrest, a juvenile arrest in the first place? Who's, who's reporting? Who's enforcing? What are the conditions under which that happens? And again, that's not necessarily here. But these are the kinds of questions we might want to consider asking to try to understand what, what this is all about here. What do you think we have in our community as assets to address this kind of issue? Heather saying NAACP, a local chapter, absolutely. Any other ideas? I mean, bringing this data directly to the police departments and asking them to explain what the difference is in the data, how this is, how this is happening. That's an excellent point. Yeah. I mean, there's certainly different uh, differences across individuals in law enforcement and differences in different departments. Um, so it would be really interesting to explore. That is true. If we knew by even um, zip codes mm -hmm. where these arrests were being made, um, yeah, that might be helpful. What jurisdictions they're, they have been arrested under. So the kinds of things we're talking about now, bringing these data to someone to seek additional information, explanations, changes. Those are the kinds of things that we hope um, this conversation and others would lead to so that it, this isn't just a data source that gets 
into a presentation or report, as great as that is, but just really leads to um, some deeper dives about what is going on here, what can we do about it? So the that's what we're trying to nudge everyone towards. And we, um, we know that that takes time and effort, and it feels like people may not have bandwidth for that, but if there is an issue that you see on data share that calls out to you in this way, um, you would have good company from these groups of discussions to, um, to think about how to bring that forward. And there are certainly organizations, coalitions, um, other allies in the community to help do that. And I, I want to say one thing about the disaggregation by region or zip code or census track, because none of the indicators that we looked at today um, had those breakdowns um, or those breakouts. Um, but that kind of um, generally that's because there isn't enough population wide data to be able to show statistical uh, significance, which is um, I'm just looking right now at our indicator um, list. I've put the link into the chat. I don't know if you want to share screen, Nicole, but if you are looking, let's say that your program of focus or your area of focus is in a particular part of the county, you can look at this indicator list um, by location level. And if you, just because I've seen who's in the group. If you want to scroll down to child care and early child care, childhood education, Nicole, thank you. You'll see the columns that show um, which ones are dis, um, are able to be disaggregated by regions or zip codes. And you'll see that all of the DOJ ones are not. Um, <laughs> and then a lot of the, um, the larger population kind of um, well-being data is also not able to be um, broken out by region, but then there's a lot of indication indicators that can be. Um, so that's something to pay attention to. Um, you'll see on this list, the whole library of data points. Um, and I just, for those who, do you want to do this kind of targeted um, data dive? Um, if you want to choose any of these indicators that have um, multiple check marks on them, I just want to show people the way that the um, visualization looks. So you can go to the county. Um, this is the way that I do it. You can um, touch any button you like there. But then at the bottom here, under this initial indicator page, you'll see that it'll give you breakouts for the county regions zip codes, census places, and census tracts. Um, so then you can have a mapped version. You can have a breakout by zip code if you're doing super targeted work. Um, this measure is for um, renters spending 30% or more of household income on rent. But there, um, I think there's over 100 data points on the site that um, do provide this regional um, view. For some reason, the map's not loading. I find the map to be extremely helpful. Um, I do too, and I, I think it's my slow Wi-Fi, not, okay. not the site. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well. Try that again. Um, Let's see. Yeah. I'll try it with census. We're trying to lure everyone back to the site to see the cool map. <laughs> Part of the strategy. Yeah, I can also, um, can also share. Okay. Let's try um, that. And I do want to say, um, so I've heard a lot of what kind of the commentary has been around, um, you know, how do we contextualize this data? How does this data measure and compare to our experience in the field? Um, and then just a couple points about the, you know, um, how can we have better access to the data that we're reporting to, to the state? So I'll be following up um with Julie on that um but please feel free to reach out to me at any time I'm happy to you know hop on a 10 minute call and answer questions or a longer call um <clears throat> and then how I also heard a lot about how important any of the breakout data is um so those disaggregations by age gender ethnicity and um and of course region which we weren't able to get into today um but um 
and then how to think about linking what we're seeing on this macro data um, to, to the bodies that have control and power in our county. So, you know, we, we focused on the police department and those arrests, but that could really stand for any um, any agency that is holding either financial resource in this, um, you know, in this field or um, political clout in this field or other um, other uh, points of leverage. Um, this really can be a, a starting uh, place uh, to hold up the, you know, just a little bit of um, backbone data to make um, decisions and to drive um, some of the work forward. And like I said, I'm happy to um, put any any materials together for any groups um, that might be helpful. Um, for me, it's fast because I'm on the platform all the time. So um, I'd be happy to, um, to do that um, if it's helpful. Thanks, Eva, and thanks, Eric. I'd like to thank our interpretation translation team, Stella Lauerman and Gisela Carrasco. Um, for their help today. And before we let you go, we did want to put in a plug for some other upcoming events. So next up is a core coffee chat at a different time. We often do those on Tuesday mornings, but this one will be on a Thursday afternoon just to mix things up a little bit. And it's just going to be um, some ideas and tips about um, proposal writing, grant writing. And so we hope that you will attend no matter what your level of experience is to share some of your ideas and um, challenges and learn from others. On Monday, May 22nd, there will be a bilingual town hall on transitional kindergarten. Um, it's going to be led by and for families and we'll have some um, information coming soon to the core mailing list. It'll be uh, co-hosted with First Five. And then on the 20th of June, we'll do another session like this one, but on the indicators related to stable, affordable housing and shelter. So um, if you are interested in that and how it connects to other work and or know others who might be interested, let them know, but we will be sending out information on that as well. So thanks everyone for hanging in there and for participating and sharing your insights and ideas. Um, and we hope this encourages you to return to data share again and again and see its improvements over time. Thanks a lot and don't forget to fill out your feedback poll. We really pay attention to these.